In Toronto, Canada, in a little room above a beauty parlor, a woman dies. The year is 1960. Only those at the funeral know the history of the woman in the open coffin. She is the sister of the last Russian Tsar. She was born to unimaginable wealth and splendor. Her life was set against the backdrop of an entire century. It was a life filled with forbidden love, enduring passion and revolution. Such is the story of Olga, the last Grand Duchess of Russia. It was another time. The countries of Europe were ruled by kings and queens, and they were all related to each other. Olga's family portrait. Uncle Edward and Aunt Alexandra, the future rulers of England. Her uncle, the King of Greece. Her aunt, the Queen of Greece. Her father, the Tsar of Russia. Her mother, Princess Dagmar of Denmark. Her grandfather, Christian the Ninth, the King of Denmark. And her grandmother, the Queen of Denmark. Grand Duchess Olga was related by blood to virtually every royal family in Europe. On the 1st of June in the year 1882, in the city of St. Petersburg, a daughter the Grand Duchess Olga was born to His Imperial Highness, the Sovereign Emperor Alexander III. From his palace of Peterhof near St. Petersburg in Russia, Olga's father, the Tsar, ruled over one-sixth of the world. When Olga was born in honor of the Grand Duchess, the cannons saluted in St. Petersburg. There was cannon fire from the squadron ships in Peterhof, where the squadron was based. Not everybody could read at that time. It was the cannon fire that informed the people a child was born to the Tsar's family. Colossal changes occurred during these last 100 years in Russia. But in our archive, we keep everything. We are the people's memory. We are Russia's memory. We keep all the documents remaining in Russia and concerning the Grand Duchess Olga Alexandrovna. These are the documents of her birth, christening, marriage. What does it mean to be a Tsar's daughter? From her very birth, each and every step of the Grand Duchess was regulated. Protocol for the Holy Christening of the Grand Duchess Olga. The Romanov dynasty had been in power for 300 years. The power of the Tsar was absolute. Olga's father ruled over the country. Her mother ruled over the family. There were five children. The eldest, Nicholas, was fated to be the last Tsar of Russia. The youngest, Olga, was her father's favorite. My darling Papa, I miss you dreadfully. I hope you're well. Alexander and the baby are coming today. Mrs. Franklin, Olga's British nanny, fed her porridge for breakfast and taught her to write and speak English. My darling Papa, I congratulate you on your name's day. Today we had tea. Olga and her father shared a special, informal relationship. But even a simple visit to her mother was by protocol. Now it is 11 minutes past 9 and I must go to Mama's room like every morning. 
In 1888, young Olga realized the danger Russian royals were exposed to. On a trip to the Crimea, the royal train skidded on the tracks and crashed. Most likely, the accident was an act of terrorism by Russia's early revolutionaries. The Tsar's family miraculously survived. Little Olga ran from the wreckage, screaming, "They are coming to kill us all!" She was just six years old. The Romanovs' fear. It is a traditional fear transmitted from generation to generation. Olga's grandfather was assassinated. Her father was constantly threatened with assassination attempts against him. This is a real fear, a real tragedy, which constantly soared over the family. In response to the dangers surrounding them, the Tsar moved his family to the palace of Gatchina. It was far from the capital, and most importantly, it was easy to guard. It was a lonely life for young Olga in the 500-room palace. She filled the hours at Gatchina, drawing and painting, recording her life. I don't remember a time when I didn't have a brush in my hand. Olga's siblings were much older. Only her brother Misha was still at the palace. I grew up with Misha and without comrades. The two children had no ordinary playmates. But we did not miss them because the sailors and soldiers who were guarding us at the palace were always ready to play with us. And there were always flowers waiting for me in the garden. Summers were a special time for Olga. It was when she and her family got to visit Olga's grandfather, the King of Denmark. The visits were a semblance of normal life for the Russian royal family. Mom, dear, told me this morning that I could go to Copenhagen with Nikki and Alex as they are going shopping. I'm so happy. Fredsborg was the summer residence of the Danish royal family, and the members of the different European royal houses used to meet there every summer. It was a tradition because the Danish king Christian the Ninth had so many beautiful daughters who were married to the English royal house, the Russian czar's family, and to different European princes. When these royal people were in Fredensborg, they were much more human in the way that they related to others. When they were freed from the stiff rituals of home. In Fredensborg, Olga could watch the royal families behave just like ordinary people. The future kings and queens of Europe would make fun of each other. For Olga, it was a revelation. Christmas book, 1893. Now we are in Petersburg, and the New Year's Eve is past. 1894 has come. That year, Olga's father succumbed to a long illness. Supremely sanctioned protocol for the internment of the Emperor, the pious Alexander the Third, who passed away in the grace of God. Darling Papa, at last, very peacefully passed away to another, much happier world. We are so awfully miserable. 
What will life be without him? A pass to enter the Peter and Paul fortress in St. Petersburg during the interment of Tsar Alexander III. I walked in procession after the coffin carried by six horses. In the morning I went to the fortress with the others and we stood for two hours and then we kissed Papa dear for the last time and he was laid by the side of his mother in the floor. Then we came home. It's all too horrid without him. Two years later, Olga's brother Nicholas became Russian Tsar. It was the last coronation in Russian history. Supremely sanctioned protocol for the holy coronation of His Majesty the Emperor Nicholas II, the ruler of Russia. Olga was 14. We at last got to the Kremlin. We descended from the golden carriages and walked in a long procession along planks spread with red cloth till we got to the church. I couldn't see Nikki for a while, but I saw Mama as she sat there on a throne with a diamond crown on her head and a lot of gentlemen holding up her long train with ermine mantle. Nikki stood up and read the creed. Then a big mantle was put on his shoulders and a crown was given to him. He put it on himself, as no one was higher than him. When we left the church, the crowd cried hurrah, and we had to bow and pretend to be pleased. We had stood for hours. I laughed the whole time and had nothing to do with the tiring ceremonials. When Grand Duchess Olga was 19, her mother decided it was time for her to be married. Romanov girls usually left Russia to find a proper, noble match. But her mother wanted Olga to remain in Russia. A marriage was arranged. I never thought for an instance that today my life would be changed. I found myself alone in a room with Peter he came up to me, took my hand, and said he loved me. I consented to marry him. I don't even know if I was happy. I was only frightened. Fancy anyone wanting me. Prince Peter of Oldenburg lived in Russia. He was a long-time family friend, much older, and a homosexual. In 1901, Olga was wed to Prince Peter of Oldenburg. What does it mean, the wedding of a Grand Duchess? It means luxury and splendor. Dowry of the Grand Duchess Olga. Pink velvet train, pink skirt with silk lining, blue skirt with silk lining. Four crepe skirts, brooch with sapphires and diamonds, necklace with sapphires and diamonds, tiara with sapphires and diamonds. Total, 339,400 rubles. The dress was worth 50,000 rubles. 
which at the time was a tremendous sum. A farmer could buy a cow for just four rubles. The sovereign emperor, in the exercise of his supreme will, has ordered that a dowry be granted for Her Imperial Highness Grand Duchess Olga, the sum of one million rubles. I had to sit before a gold looking glass while Monsieur de la Croix put the diamond veil and crown onto my head. Oh, the weight of it all. Supremely sanctioned protocol for the nuptials of Her Imperial Highness, the Grand Duchess Olga, and His Highness Prince Peter, the Duke of Oldenburg. After the ceremony, we went to the station. In the train, Peter and I then went to bed in the same cabin. It is all very strange. The couple moved into their palace in St. Petersburg, where they lived separate lives. Peter continued his life of gambling and young men. Olga returned to her royal duties. She did charity work, and she was a lady-in-waiting to her mother, the Dowager Empress. She also spent a great deal of time with her nieces, the daughters of the Tsar. One of her favorites was the youngest, little Anastasia. In 1903, Olga went to a military review. Her eyes fell on a tall, fair man. He was Nikolai Kulikovsky, an officer. The two fell in love. The daughter of the Russian Tsar had fallen in love with a commoner. The family did not approve. Olga told her husband right away that she did not love him and that she would like to have a divorce and marry another man whom she loved. Prince Peter said no. But Peter made a concession. He would hire Kulikovsky as his aide. Olga and Kulikovsky could be near each other and wait for the possibility of a divorce. They waited for 13 years. In 1914, the First World War began. Kulikovsky and his regiment were sent off to the front. The women of the royal family were expected to contribute to the war effort. Olga chose to be a nurse. She traveled to the front. War began, and I do not think that she followed Kulikovsky. She left for the front as her heart told her to do. She organized hospitals there. She was a grand duchess and had all the means for it. Organization of the hospitals took a lot of strength from Grand Duchess Olga because one had to supply dressing material equipment, find personnel, pay the personnel some money. My darling, 
Greetings to you for Christmas. I am full of my own thoughts and hospital work. We have about seven or eight operations every day. I love my work, just what I always wanted. I still find time to paint. It was so great to be with you. It's strange to think that it will be Christmas, the time when everybody is together. You and I are apart. Everything in this life is backwards. For instance, we would like to get married, and it's impossible. We would like to have our own children, and it's impossible. In the end, we would like to be together always, and it's always impossible. I kiss you. God bless you and protect you. Olga Only her brother the Tsar could give her permission to divorce. Dear Nikki, do tell me once what you really think. Don't you think that to finish with a divorce now, during the war, while all eyes and minds are occupied elsewhere, would be better? My darling Olga, it was great to have seen you twice, but I'm sorry it was not more than just a few minutes. You have my permission and all my blessing. I hug you lovingly. Your old brother, Nikki. One of the last decrees signed by the Emperor Nicholas II. To the governing Senate, the marriage between Olga and Prince Peter of Oldenburg is annulled. Excerpt from the marriages for the year 1916. On November 5th, Her Imperial Highness Grand Duchess Olga was wed to Captain Nikolai Kulikovsky. From that moment on, Olga and her husband were always together, and the Grand Duchess insisted on being called simply Mrs. Kulikovsky. Three months after their wedding, the Russian Revolution broke out. It would alter the course of the entire world. Such changes that I thought of going mad and can't sleep, and when I do, all the events go on in my dreams. Olga's brother, the Tsar, was forced to abdicate. Life became dangerous for members of the entire royal family. Olga, her husband and her mother fled to the family estates in the Crimea. It was a bitter night. I wore nothing but my nurse's uniform. I remember the moment when looking upon my small case, I realized that I owned nothing else in the world. In the house in the Crimea, Olga gave birth to a son. She was 35 years old. It was very difficult to get provisions. None of us had any money. And the only reason we weren't killed was because they couldn't decide who should kill us. Olga was pregnant again, and she made a decision. She left her mother and went with her husband and son to hide out in the Caucasus an area not yet in Bolshevik hands. The future was uncertain. The air is full of rumors. We don't know where my nieces and their parents are. Olga never heard from her brother Nicholas, his wife and her nieces again. In 1918, the Tsar's entire family were imprisoned and killed. The Romanovs who stayed here perished, all of them. They were shot or tortured to death. Only those who left Russia or were abroad at the time, 
those were saved. In 1919, Russia's civil war was at its peak. The King of England sent a boat to pick up Olga's mother. Marooned in another part of the country, Olga and her husband managed to escape one year later. She had given birth to a second son. She never saw Russia again. From the Danish consulate in Novorossiysk, the Grand Duchess Olga has left Russia. From the Danish embassy in Belgrade, we have been informed that Grand Duchess Olga, sister of the killed Tsar, is en route. The Grand Duchess Olga left today, Thursday morning. Will be arriving in Copenhagen Friday evening. Please inform her mother, the Dowager Empress. When the Dowager Empress and Olga were rescued out of the civil war in Russia, they then came to Denmark. They were first accommodated in the castle Emelianborg, which is the Danish royal family's official residence. The Empress and her retinue soon moved into the Villa of Vidore. Olga and her family moved with her. One should remember the extreme contrast between coming here while they were the reigning royal house in Russia and when they came the second time, when they were expulsed and driven away from their country, having lost everything they had and being political refugees. At the side of her mother, Olga had once again become a prisoner of protocol. Vidore was still... It was soldiers from the guards, and they were on watch all of the time. So you could say that it still was a palace, and that was what Grand Duchess Olga didn't like. What tortured Grand Duchess Olga was that her husband, Kulikovsky, was never really accepted by her mother. And it was hard for her daughter, who cares for her husband. That's why they never could have an ideal and happy life with the mother there. For her mother, Olga carried out the various duties of companion, lady's maid and secretary. I live so much in the past that sometimes I'm frightened. Maybe I'm missing my life now, like that between my fingers. People in Denmark expected the royal family to behave like royalty. Olga didn't fit the mold. It was disappointing to the Russian emigration that had come here that Grand Duchess Olga didn't take the position that they would have liked her to take. It was hard for the Grand Duchess Olga to escape the past, especially when it kept coming back to haunt her. In 1920, the news traveled like wildfire around the world. A woman had been fished out of a Berlin Canal. She claimed to be Anastasia, the youngest daughter of the Tsar. Suppose she really were the little girl. Heaven alone knows if she is or not. She wasn't my little niece at all. She is just a poor, misguided woman. Olga's mother, the Russian Dowager Empress, died at Vidari in 1928. Her funeral was at the Russian Orthodox Church in Copenhagen. It was the end of an era in European history.
With the Empress's death, Olga and her husband could finally begin to live their own life. Olga was 46. She changed quite a bit after her mother died. She was more free. She was more happy. In the small Danish village of Ballerup, there is a museum devoted to the Grand Duchess Olga, who lived there from 1930 until 1948. I'd like to talk about how it all began with Grand Duchess Olga. Grand Duchess Olga and her husband bought a big farm in Ballerup, and when they arrived there in 1930, Ballerup was a small, mini-society, you could say, and was strongly class-divided. She was a very peculiar type. She could come up one day with her long rubber boots, wear her Romanov brooch, sit in her horse-drawn cab and drive to the market and deliver potatoes or something else from their farm. They were totally straightforward, just ordinary people. Grand Duchess Olga was my godmother. She came often to our house, actually, every morning in the 30s, because there were lots of trees she could paint. She always wanted to have coffee, but our family was very poor, so they only had metal mugs. Olga was very close to her goddaughter's family. Alfred, the father, became one of her closest friends. I remember my godmother as a very happy person during the 30s, and that was while I was a child. Very, very animated. Very, very happy. When she had to go to the royal dinners, she wasn't very happy. Perhaps a little affected by all her growing up time, where everything had to be formal, and she couldn't be herself, really. In Ballerup, Olga and Nikolai farmed and raised their two sons. When World War II broke out, Denmark was occupied by the Germans. Olga's life went on seemingly unchanged. Her two sons were growing up, and in 1942, her eldest son wanted to get married. She also had given her boys the freedom to choose to marry whomever they wanted to. And one of them fell in love with a daughter of a farmer, the other, a daughter of a kiosk owner. And of course, it was always something when a poor girl married to Grand Duchess Olga's son. 
We came to the church and there were so many people outside, I got a shock. <laughs> but you know, it's because like that a poor girl marry a, he should have married a princess then there wouldn't have been that many. <laughs> but he only wanted me. It was very difficult under the war, because now I remember that the Grand Duchess didn't want to eat because she felt that it was better for us young to eat. But I felt so bad about it because I didn't like that idea to see one sitting on the table and not eat. It should have been for all of us the same. And we ate so many of the rabbits here. So I was so tired of eating rabbits. <laughs> I never would do it again, never. So, but we came through it somehow. During the occupation, the Germans brought Soviet prisoners of war to Denmark. Their presence would create a major turning point in Olga's life. In May 1945, with the collapse of Germany, Denmark was liberated by the British. One part of Denmark, the island of Bornholm, however, was liberated by the Soviet army. The Soviet refused to leave. One should remember that Denmark was and is located very close to the Soviet Union. And Denmark had also felt in 1945 to 46 that the Red Army liberated, and you could say, occupied the island Bornholm, where they stayed for one year. Olga's nephew, the Crown Prince of Denmark, greeted the Soviet army. So one can easily imagine that Olga was terrified about the thought that the Danish government would give in to the Soviet pressure and deliver her to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union demands the return of all Soviet citizens from Denmark. Some Soviet citizens who had been prisoners of war didn't want to return to the Soviet Union. Anyone that didn't want to return was considered a war criminal. There where the Grand Duchess lived, one day a man came and asked, Your Royal Highness, could there be any possibility for me to work at your house? Because I don't want to go back to the Soviet Union. And he stayed there for a month and helped in the farm. Pravda, June 19, 1947. There is someone protecting war criminals in Denmark. The former Grand Duchess Olga helps war criminals. In the Soviet Union, they had not forgotten that there was one last remaining Romanov in Denmark. The archives in Denmark reveal the worries of the Danish government. Top secret. Confidential. The Grand Duchess Olga is accused of hiding Soviet war criminals and providing them with papers, supporting them economically and otherwise in order to enable them to leave for other countries other than the Soviet Union. Police Department. Our investigation has revealed that the Grand Duchess did not give any prisoners false papers or help to leave Denmark. The only support she gave them was maybe a meal. But Olga could not afford to wait for the outcome. She had to flee. They began to pack. The whole of the house was kind of a packing department with big cases. And there she sat and painted. I think she painted herself the way out of all her worries.
At the age of 66, Grand Duchess Olga was once again a refugee. Danish Consul General in Montreal. Grand Duchess Olga and her family are arriving from Denmark to Canada. This morning at 7 a.m. I walked on board the SS Empress of Canada to greet the Grand Duchess Olga and her family and to offer my help concerning their arrival in Canada. What I met was an immigrant family. The Grand Duchess was doubtlessly the one who was expected to carry the entire burden. We come to Canada. We arrived in Canada on the Empress of Canada in June 1948 after a terrible voyage. None in my family are strong except my grandmother and grandfather. After we had been sick about a day or so, then she came down in the cabin and picked me up and took me out on the deck so that I could get some fresh air. And then I made the rest of the journey, almost sitting on the deck of Empress of Canada. Empress of Canada. The King of England made Olga's flight to Canada possible. Canada needed agricultural workers. A farm in Campbellville was the solution. Dear Alfred, here you see the house where we now live in Toronto, seen from the garden. Our pictures have been in the magazines here, and now everybody knows my face. When I go out to do my shopping in the morning, everybody in the shops have become so friendly it puzzles me. Why? What am I to people here? Maybe my grandmother was different from other people. She was just grandmother, and I didn't think of her as a grand duchess. She was a little peculiar version of a grandmother because she couldn't cook. She had two dishes in her repertoire. The one was chicken, and the other was fish. When the family came to dinner, that was what we got. And the dessert was ice cream, because she didn't need to make it. My grandmother was an active person. She was very social. She had a large circle of people she knew, both from where we used to live and friends she got in Canada. The Russian community of Toronto was a part of Olga's social circle. When she was well, uh, we were uh, visiting her and uh, she would come visit us and she would cook with mother. She wasn't Grand Duchess, she was just an ordinary friend. And she was very, very often in our house. For my father, Grand Duchess was Grand Duchess. For him, it was a piece of Russia. My grandfather loved my grandmother. Even as old people, they would hold hands. I came very often into the living room, and he was holding her hand. With their two sons away, working at their own jobs, it was too difficult for Olga and Nikolai to work the farm. And once again, they were forced to move. Dear Alfred, now we are in our little house in Cooksville. It is difficult to unpack everything because my husband is so ill and so weak. He can't walk anymore. The day my grandfather died, my grandmother brought me to my grandfather and showed me him and said that he was dead. And she took his hands and crossed them and kissed him.
It was a terrible day. I just remember that my grandmother was very quiet and she sat down and started painting. After grandfather died, life went really slowly. But the world would not let Olga forget who she had been. In the last year of her life, she had to continue to perform royal duties. When the English Queen Elizabeth II was traveling in Canada in 1959, she came to Toronto and invited my grandmother to visit her for lunch on her royal ship, the Britannia. Lucky few to have lunch with Queen aboard Britannia. Thousands will see the Queen when she comes to Toronto. A few will meet her, and a very lucky group of less than 50 will be guests at the Queen's party. What to wear is the question bothering most women invited. It was a circus, because my grandmother wasn't particularly interested in clothes. But the family insisted that she should have a new dress and hat, of course. You should wear that to the lunch. So my grandmother was taken into town, got a nice blue floral pattern hat and a dress. That same year, Olga had one more difficult duty to perform. The world wanted to believe that Anastasia, the youngest daughter of the Tsar, had survived. Olga was called to testify. Once again, the problem comes before a court. The District Court of Hamburg, which is trying to decide between the woman who claims she is the daughter of the last of the Tsars and the Romanov relatives who claim the real Anastasia died with him in the massacre of 40 years ago. I am 77 years old. I am the daughter of Tsar Alexander III. I am the sister of Tsar Nicholas II. I hereby declare that the woman claiming to be Anastasia is not my niece. Dear Alfred, I am a skeleton, but I am still painting. I have been sick. I have been lying down and painting. I have made 20 watercolors and sold two of them. For a few years that we knew Grand Duchess, she was just like an uh, ordinary person. But by the end of her life, she was Grand Duchess. The doctor phoned from, from Cooksville when he went to see Grand Duchess, and he found her uh, very sick, very ill, and uh, then he asked us if he can bring Grand Duchess to our house. Grand Duchess came to our house, already to stay till the end. The last two hours of Grand Duchess' life was terrible. Probably she was running completely through her life, she was so excited, her life was passing by. Olga, the last Grand Duchess, died in Toronto on November 24th, 1960.